Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy McCready here at Rhombus University. We are here on October the 5th, 2023. And our presenter this evening is Dr. Fred Blackburn. And he is here to discuss the philosophy of mind and mental illness. So we are happy to have you, Dr. Blackburn. Thanks so much for having me. I'm yes. very excited. Um, I've been a college professor for over 30 years, um, primarily at San Diego Christian College, which was formerly Christian Heritage College. And the last year and a half, I have been living up in Humboldt, California, but I am definitely having teaching withdrawals, so I'm very thankful for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to sharing um, one of my favorite topics is philosophy of mind, and I thought this would tie in really nicely with Rhombus University and especially your master's in psychology program. And you'll kind of get a taste of a philosophic approach to a lot of things that you all are dealing with from a psychological approach. And next week I may talk a little bit about um, the history of psychology and how it came out of philosophy, at least that's my opinion and perspective. And we can talk about some of the early movements and I'm so fascinated by, I'm really glad I checked in last week and watched the talk with your um, college president. And it was so interesting to me to hear um, some of the approaches they took in counseling, especially with addiction, um, drugs and alcohol addiction. And what was the name of the therapy he was using? Was it called coaching? therapy or interview therapy? I didn't quite catch the, how he labeled it. Motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing. And I thank you. And as I was listening to him talk, it reminded me a lot about the early um, talk therapy where people would be engaged and they'd be encouraged to discuss themselves. And during that process, things would eventually come up, um, their struggles, their hopes, dreams, fears, what they wanted to improve, what they wanted to change in their lives. And so tonight, I, I thought we would start with philosophy of mind. And I got a PowerPoint, I'm going to share screen with you all. And let's get into it. All right, so philosophy of mind and mental illness. And one of the first big questions as a philosopher we have to discuss, um, we're kind of definition junkies in philosophy, and we like to define things to death. And so the first thing we have to do is define what is mind. And depending on how people define what the mind is, we come up with this different list of theories of then how people approach not only the philosophy of mind, but also how to apply it in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Anyone want to give a shot at defining what mind is for me? I thought I would lecture about the first 45 minutes an hour, and then mm -hmm. I just want to spend the less of our time together discussing, but I would just as soon discuss on our way through. What is mind? Yes. I think well, mine is uh, cognitive components um, and being able to articulate those components. Would, wouldn't, would you be able to have a mind even if you couldn't articulate? Yes. Good. Okay, good. Anyone else want to give it a shot? What is mind? Receiving and processing information. Okay. But a computer does that. It's true. Is uh, there that's... something unique about the human mind that differentiates it from just like an organic computer? Consciousness. Oh, consciousness. And then that begs the new question, right? And, but that's the la where we're headed this evening is I'm going to ask you to define what consciousness is. <laughs> um, for the ancient Greeks, 
not that they have all knowledge on all things, but for the ancient Greeks, they separated the mind from the body. And in that sense, they were dualists. They believed they had a physical material body, but they also believed they had a non-material mind. And the mind was made up of three major components. Um, first, we have the noose and that, or I'm sorry, we have the logos, which is like analytical reasoning. And then we have the cardia, which where we get the word heart from. So that would be our feelings and emotions. And then the highest function of the mind, according to the Greeks, was the noose, N-O-U-S. And they believe this is the realm of first principles. Well, like if you're familiar with Platonism and the Platonic forms, that's where they believed would be that seat of knowledge. And so with those three combined, um, that was kind of the Greek concept of mind separating it from the Bible. Later, when we have Christianity coming in and kind of syncretizing a lot of Christian and Jewish theology with Greek thought in the medieval period, we do get this traditional medieval view that humans have a soul or spirit, which would be tied into their mind, their non-tangibles, along with a physical material body. And so that was very much a part of the Western tradition up until the 16th century. And it is there that we get a man named Rene Descartes. And if you're familiar with the history of philosophy, the 16th century is also what we call the age of reason. We have left the medieval age of faith and we've entered into the age of reason. And a lot of philosophers are now starting to reevaluate things that we had just taken for granted. And I'm going to see if I can pull up a picture real quick of the guy I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> I might have had to preload that one. Anyways, you can Google him and look him up if you want. Um, but his name is Rene Descartes. And Rene Descartes um, becomes called the father of modern philosophy. But he was a dualist. And in his philosophy, what he was emphasizing was that there are two substances in the universe. And these two substances are thought which would relate to mind, and extension, which would relate to matter. So in thought and mind, he believes mind can affect other minds, like the ideas and concepts I'm sharing with you tonight in class will affect your ideas and concepts. But for me to physically affect you, I would have to physically touch you or use another physical object to interact with your physicality. It's kind of goes back to that sticks and stones can break your bones, but names will never hurt me. And it's kind of relating it to the fact that you can call me all kinds of stuff you want, but it won't physically hurt me. It certainly could mentally hurt someone, though. And that's where we're kind of missing the point of that childhood chant. And the same way, I could think bad thoughts about you all day, but it's not going to cause you physical harm. And so in... The mental, in thought and extension, Descartes runs into a problem with what's called Cartesian dualism because he says mind can only affect mind and matter can only affect matter. But he also shared the belief that human beings were made up of mind and matter. And so the $20 million question becomes, how am I able to use my mind to move this matter? And I like to mess with my with my students a lot in my other classes, and I've been trying to telekinetically move my coffee mugs for years. And so I don't know if you can see. No, I got my zoom on. But with this coffee mug, I mean, I can think at this mug all day long, and I cannot even move it a millimeter, even though I have a pretty powerful mind. But if I get a thought in my head that I'm thirsty, that thought, the way Descartes described it, he said, 
the animal spirits in the pineal gland are agitated with the thought I have that I'm thirsty, and those animal spirits vibrate in the pineal gland, which affects the animal spirits in the blood, which will travel down my arm and grab my coffee mug, bring it to my lips, which will then, the animal spirits will vibrate up my arm to outside my pineal gland, which will let me know I've taken my sip, and then it will tell me to put my coffee mug back down. And what's so interesting is even in he's talking in these weird medieval terms like animal spirits, he's basically defining like the central nervous system before people were doing um, autopsies and really had understood the physiology of what it meant to be a human. Um, the problem is even if that is true and that's what's happening, it's not like we can put a camera into the pineal gland of the brain and look at what's happening because what's happening is not a physical material thing. It can't be physically, thoughts are not physical material objects. And so I really don't believe Descartes solved the mind body problem. And it leaves us with this question of why am I able to move this physical body, but I can't move other bodies external to this one. Any questions or comments on, on that? No? Okay. So he's the one that sets us off with this dualism. Um, later, we're going to get into monism and monist. There's two major types of monists. There's spiritualist and materialist. Um, then we will talk into behaviorism, which is kind of applied materialism to psychology. And then we're going to talk about epiphenomenalism and there's a good twenty dollar word for you now i want us to talk about um what is mental illness i named this um four-part series after a class i took in college um after the same name philosophy of mind and mental illness and this was at san diego state and the very first day of class the professor gets up front and the very first thing he says to us is I want to make it perfectly clear, you have a brain, you do not have a mind. And I was thinking, okay, I'm glad he gave us his presuppositions up front, because I knew what to expect. But I was really hoping to take a class on the non-physical aspects of what the mind is. But instead, I ended up learning a lot about the human brain and how it affects different types of behavior, which was also very valuable. But even though that was his opening statement, we did discuss some of the competing theories. And the other thing he brought up the first day of class, he asked, what is sick or broken? Is it the mind or the brain? Okay. And depending on your worldview, that answer is going to vary greatly. So for your um, materialist, your naturalist materialist, they do not believe we have a mind. They believe we have a brain. We have a physical brain and all mental states, feelings, emotions, drives, desires can be explained physically. If you're more of a spiritualist, you might not even believe you have a physical body, that your body is an illusion, that illness is an illusion or it's a mental state of being or a problem. If any of you have ever encountered um, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, many of them hold to this belief. They don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is they don't believe in physical or mental illness as being a physical issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's a psychological issue that needs to be dealt with in that way. So that's a good thing to know if you're checking into a Jehovah's Witness healthcare system. They're not going to be treating your physical body unless it has to do with treating the mind or the soul or the spirit. That is where their focus is going to be. Also, in Eastern religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, there would be a strong emphasis on everything in this physical material world. It's transitory. It's impermanent. That which abides and lasts is mind or spirit. And so there is that connection. And then Christians, of course, would tend to be more like Descartes in the sense that we do believe we have a real physical body. Um, 
it may not be permanent. It may return to the dust from whence it came, but we have an immortal soul that will continue and abide after the perishing of the body. So there's three kind of examples of how this works. And once again, depending on where you're coming from and your worldview, when we talk about mental illness, um, there could mean very different things from one group actually thinking, well, there's something broken or damaged in your physical brain to other people saying, no, there's something broken or damaged in your mind, that non-material part of yourself. Any questions on that slide? Okay, so this is kind of like the little dictionary definition of dualism. Dualist and philosophy of mind emphasize the radical difference between mind and matter. They all deny that the mind is the same as the brain, and some deny that the mind is wholly a product of the brain at all. Um, this article explores the various ways that dualists attempt to explain this radical difference between the mental and the physical world a wide range of arguments for and against the various dualistic options are discussed. So what do you think that sentence means? They all deny that the mind is the same as the brain, and some deny that the mind is wholly a product of the brain. What does that mean? What else could be influencing the mind besides the brain? Um, a spirit? A spirit, yes. What else? How about your gut? You hear people like, I went with my gut, and people even talk about in, in our cardia area that in some cultures, that is the seat of where consciousness is. I also teach cultural anthropology. I think it's so interesting. There was a tribe in Papua New Guinea that believe consciousness or the mind resided in the throat, not the brain, the heart, or the belly, but the throat. And I'll never forget, they were burying this woman alive because she had lost the ability to speak. And as far as the tribe was concerned, even though her eyes were open, she was moving all this stuff, because she couldn't speak, they thought she had passed because it would be like in our culture, looking at someone that was brain dead or something like that, because her throat was no longer functioning. And so that is the power of culture when we look at these sorts of topics. Um, but I, it's so interesting. There is a lot of contemporary research going on now about gut health and probiotics and all that kind of stuff and how supposedly that can actually affect our mental states of being, not just our physical well-being, but even our mental well-being, a connection not just with the brain or the heart, but even the gut and all the little bacteria and critters that live inside of us. <clears throat> okay, monism. Priority monism states that all existing things go back to a source that is distinct from them. So, for example, in Neoplatonism, everything is derived from the one. In this view, only the one is ontologically basic or prior to everything else. Well, there's a bunch of big, obnoxious philosophical words for you. So, so let's go through these. Neoplatonism. This was a theory developed in the third century AD by Plotinus. And neo means new. And he was bringing about what he considered a new and improved Platonism or Platonic thought. And if you remember, Plato, the Greek philosophy for Plato, believed, I'm going to minimize this for a minute so I can look at you. Okay, so the Greek philosopher Plato visualized that there's this realm of eternal forms, and this cannot be created or destroyed, but everything that you could possibly ever know or come up with or invent has always existed in this realm. It's kind of like co-equal with the mind of God, and that's how Plotinus um, synthesized Platonism. He put all these eternal forms into the very mind of God. And then below the mind of God, we have this realm of concepts and how we can think about things. And then below the conceptual realm, we have the actual physical material realm. So we have like these layers of reality. The eternal forms are most real. 
then we have the concepts of those forms, and then we have the physical manifestations of those forms. And let me give you an example. So this coffee mug, this is the lowest form of reality. Well, actually a drawing of this would be lower than this or a picture of it. But this physical thing, Plato would say has less reality or less permanence than the concept of coffee mug. And then that realm of eternal forms, the coffee mug there is the ultimate perfect template of what a coffee mug should be. Now we could physically destroy every coffee mug in the world, but the concept and the ideal form of coffee mugness will abide. Pretty cool. All right. So that's the Neoplatonist piece of that picture. And so he believes he he spoke in terms of emanations. And so unlike in the Genesis account where you have God separate from the creation, so you have God out here and he's making a physical world separate from himself, in Plotinus' Plotinus's cosmology, creation emanates from God. It's almost like God is a fountain and as and reality pours out of him and flows into the cosmos. And so the closer, it's almost like a wood burning stove in the corner of your room. The closer you are to the stove, the more fire, light, heat, and in this case, reality you have. But the further away you get from that radiation, the less light, heat, and ultimately reality that you have. And so that is Plotinus's view of the cosmos. Um, so he would really say there is only one thing. And in that sense, I suppose you could even say mind and brain are just two ways of talking about one thing, both proceeding from the mind of God. Existent monism posits that strictly speaking, there exists only a single thing in the universe. And in fact, that is how the medieval scholastics define substance. They said that which is self-existent and self-consistent. And there is only one being in the cosmos that matches that definition, and that is God. God is the only being that is not dependent on anything else for bringing him into existence because he always existed, and God is not dependent on anything else to keep him existing. All other beings that we're aware of were brought into existence and need their existence ex sustained by something outside of themselves. So in that sense, God would be the only thing in the universe. All right. Substance monism asserts that a variety of existing things can be explained in terms of a single reality or substance. Substance monism posits that only one kind of substance exists, although many things may be made up of this substance, such as mind or matter. Dual aspect monism is a view that the mental and the physical world are two aspects or perspectives on the same substance. That was Spinoza's view. He says it's just two different ways of talking about the same thing. Only one thing is happening, and we can speak about it mentally or we can speak about it physically. But there's only one event happening at any given time in the universe. And then finally, neutral monism believes the fundamental nature of reality to be neither mental nor physical. So that's very interesting. I don't know what their third option is, but they don't like either of those choices. Any questions on, on that slide? Now, the biggest monist I can think of would be, like I mentioned earlier, would be the Eastern religions, like in Hinduism or Buddhism, and this concept of all is one. Um, this, and a lot of people don't realize that because from the outside Hinduism, they literally have millions, if not billions of gods. But those many manifestations are like a great jewel, and each god is just like a different facet of that oneness, of that one thing, including all of us. We're just facets of the one, from amoebas to Brahman. Okay. All right, no questions? Um, sorry, sir, I guess I have a question. So for monism, is it like 
everything is God or is monism like a way to understand people? Like there's only one aspect to us or is it both of those things? Yes. Yeah, so the the spiritual monist, many of them would be comfortable with the word God. Um, some of them would just call it one or cosmic universal mind. In fact, that's what the Greek word logos means is cosmic consciousness, universal mind. How cool is that? And that's the same word John used in in John 1.1. 1, 1. I mean, in 1 John, where it talks about, in the Gospel of John, I'm sorry, um, in the first chapter, he says, in, in the beginning was the logos, cosmic mind, universal consciousness. And I just love that. In, in Chinese, the Tao would be a similar concept. If you're familiar with the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, in fact, I would say the Greek concept logos and the Chinese concept Tao are very, very close. That that would be a wonderful comparison paper. So those are our like spiritualist monists, but then we have the materialist monists that believe everything is physical matter. And it kind of goes back to like the first and second law of thermodynamics as well. Um, the idea of the conservation of energy, um, that it cannot be created or destroyed. It's eternal. It can change form. It can be dissipated or congealed. But we have the same amount as energy today as we did at the beginning. It's just, is it more or less concentrated as the changes we see in the cosmos? But the materialistic monist would boil every that thing down to the physical material, where the spiritual monist would boil everything down to the spiritual or mental, and the dualist would have a foot in both worlds. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in that sense, I would see myself as a dualist. Mm -hmm. I would certainly put the mental primarily primary over the physical, if push came to shove. Like, I would identify more with my mind than with my body. But I do believe I have a body. I don't think it's just a phantom image I'm carrying around in my head. Mm -hmm. Good so question. Would, so would pantheism be monism because it's like everything is God? Or it's a monist. Is that even in the same camp of thought? <laughs> yes, that's spot on. Oh, okay, okay. All is God. That's exactly okay. what it means. I was just curious. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And the panentheist is all is in God. And so it's a slightly different nuance of, like, I would be comfortable with that statement. All is in God, but I would not be as comfortable saying all is God. What was that word again? I'm sorry. It's pantheism, but it has an E-N stuck after pan. Panentheism. And in the okay, yes, <laughs> okay, gotcha. Th I don't know why I'm laughing. I think it's like, I, and think I it's actually cool. think that it's is a cool. more orthodox Christian position because many Christians are deist, and that's the idea where you have God out here and the physical material world here, where the pantheist believes the totality of reality is God and our very existence is nestled inside of God. It doesn't mean we are God, but it's not like God's up here somewhere and we're down here. It's God is everywhere and we are in God. And I think that's a much more biblical approach personally. Although I rarely use that word panentheism because it sounds so close to pantheism and then people get all crazy on me. <laughs> okay. I don't know why I was thinking of pan Panera bread. I love food. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And neo <laughs> Neapolitan ice cream for Neoplatonism. So there we go. All right. Okay, so with those things in mind, now we're kind of moving into actual where it interfaces with your discipline of psychology. And um I hear behaviorism's finally going out of vogue, and 
I'm very happy to hear that personally, because behaviorism is basically that materialistic worldview applied to psychology, which I don't even think you should be allowed to call yourself a psychologist if you don't believe in the psyche. If, if you believe you don't have a soul or a psyche, but you only have a soma, that's the Greek word for flesh or physical body, but they're denying the psyche, well, then you should be a physician studying the flesh, not a psychologist studying the mind. But that's that's my little bias as a philosopher. But many, of course, as I'm sure you've met in your field and discipline and especially reading and studying, many of the experts and schools of thought are deeply seated in this behavioristic worldview, which is materialism. Only the physical material exists. Um, we do not have mind, souls, or spirits. With the demise of the body and the brain is the demise of the person. The only way you live on is through your genetic code if you've been able to pass your genes on into future generations. Now, you don't have an afterlife or a reincarnation or a resurrection. Okay. And got that? So behaviorism was a movement in psychology and philosophy that emphasized the outward behavioral aspects of thought and dismissed the inward experiential and sometimes the inner procedural aspects as well. A movement hearkening back to the methodological proposals of John B. Watson, who coined the name. Um, Watson's 1913 manifesto proposed abandoning introspectionist attempts to make consciousness a subject of experimental investigation, to focus instead on behavioral manifestations of intelligence. And so what the behaviors are looking for is more of the physical behaviors that we can actually observe, test, and study, kind of use the scientific method on, because how are you supposed to observe someone's internal state of consciousness, right? How you can't put a scope or a camera inside their head to see what they're thinking, you can only base it on their reactions and how they're acting. Okay. B.F. Skinner, he's one of our biggies, right? Later hardened behavior strictures to exclude inner psychological processing along with inward experiences as items of legitimate concern. Consequently, the successful cognitive revolution of the 1960s styled itself as a revolt against behaviorism. And I don't know that much about um, the cognitive revolution. Is anyone aware of that and could just give me a little synopsis of what they're talking about? Because this is definitely coming from the psychology field. Is anyone aware of that? Did it start with um, Gestalt psychology because they wanted to look at the experience as the whole and not just behavior? I hope so. I mean, because I do know a bit about Gestalt and the, the time period is right because I think that's about when Gestalt therapy started. And for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Gestalt therapy came out of another philosophic movement called existentialism, which focused on subjectivity and the experience of the individual. And and uh, I, I want to talk about Gestalt therapy next week very much. Um, I learned about that in this class, Philosophy of Mind, and I was just fascinated by it. Um, especially their view of mental illness and and what it was. And they they would have been uncomfortable even calling it mental illness. They would have simply called it someone else's internal reality. And, and in that sense, I mean, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but when I first started teaching for rhombus, I asked them, what do you call the people you work with? Because in Gestalt therapy, you don't want to call them um, patients or mentally ill, or you don't want to put those labels on them. So they, I think, did rhombus say you call them clients? Is that the term you use for the people you help with therapy? Yes, I think patients are identified as patients within a medical facility and a client is outside of a medical facility. Thank you, James. And I, I really like that. And this idea 
and we'll get into more of this next week. But the idea is that we don't use the word crazy, et cetera, but this idea of someone being crazy or mentally ill or not right in the head, the Gestalt therapists were saying, that's a subjective cultural point of view. And in some cases, it's the person society thinks is mentally ill that could be the healthiest person in that culture, especially if you're living in a sick society, right? And so I, I think that's super interesting. And so what these Gestalt therapists aren't, they're not saying, okay, you have to conform to this mold of what society says to be a healthy person. They're simply trying to explain to the person they're working with that if you don't conform to certain norms and expectations of the culture in which you live, people will think you are mentally ill or dangerous or they're not going to want you around their children or their schools or civil civic activities. And they might incarcerate you or institutionalize you. And so you're not telling the person they're wrong or the voices in their head aren't real or any of that. You're simply explaining to them, if you go around talking to people that no one else can see, whether you can see them or not, society at large is going to think you have problems. And so the therapy consists in not changing the person's internal world, but giving them tools to navigate living with people that aren't like them or don't perceive the world like they do. And I just thought, holy cow, that's a very different than lobotomies and electroshock therapies and all that is like, they're not even judging or condemning that person saying they're wrong. They're simply saying, if you want to have certain privileges or access in the culture in which you live, these are the qualifications or conditions that are expected of you. And I don't know, anyone else have any thoughts on that? That one really resonated with me. Because I always thought a good definition of crazy would be, or mentally ill, was someone who could not or will not conform to the thoughts and norms of society. <laughs> but that could be a sinner or a saint, right? That could be both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> All right, back to that. I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'm convinced that we hey, listen to I, that we have mislabeled, uh, especially youth. Um, oh, like good lord! Take the term uh, oppositional defiance disorder. I mean, why do we do that to people rather than saying these are your survival mechanisms that you have developed, and how do we uh, recognize those absolutely and, and bring them forward? And they didn't just that come model. out of thin air. Yeah. They yeah. developed that for a reason. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's another book I, I have a recommend some things to check out at the last slide tonight. And R.D. Lang, I was introduced to him and he wrote a book called The Divided Self. And it dealt with a lot of people with uh, multiple personality disorder. And it's so interesting because I hadn't been to expose to any of that you know, i've seen the lifetime movies and stuff like that but this was a really nice in-depth study of these cases and what often happened um and this was interesting too because there did seem to be a gender divide of much more women seem to develop multiple personality disorders than men at least in our culture and I think part of the reason for that, and most of all of it had to do with severe trauma of physical or sexual abuse, um, especially for young people. And what they found is that often the female people who were subject to this abuse would internalize it, where often the young males, some of them would internalize it too, but often of them, the way they dealt with it was to victimize others that by them becoming the perpetrator, they were no longer the victim in their mind. And you think, oh, good Lord. So you see those chains, right, that begin. Um, in my youth, I worked um, for children's therapeutic communities, which was for juvenile sex offenders. And it was a house program. We had six boys per house, and these were all felon accused um, sex offenders. 
um, everything from molesting to rape. And but since they were minors, they didn't want to send them to prison or these other things. They wanted them to actually have therapy, see if they could change the lives around for these people. And I just found it so interesting because I at first I didn't know if I could work with this community, but as I got in there and part of my job was I had to read all their case files. This was one of the first things I had to do so I could see where they had come from. And every last one of those young men had been abused. They didn't come up with this behavior on their own. They learned it because of what had happened to them. But in that book, The Divided Self, R.D. Lang is saying, um, I don't know if you remember the famous book, I think it was called Run, Rabbit, Run. And it was a young girl who was being abused and she developed this other personality called Rabbit. And whenever the abuse was about to happen, Rabbit would tell her, you go away and I'm going to take the abuse. And so she split herself. She had multiple selves. And even after the abuse stopped, that this behavior was protecting her from, her psyche as the little girl, um, she wasn't able to bring herself back together into a whole and so that's what the therapist was trying to do with the multiple personality disorders, not to blame them or label them or categorize them. And that's part of the existentialism is stop labeling and categorizing people, treat them as individuals. But that's next week. <laughs> so we'll get there. And I just it really changed my view of that type of mental illness and thinking of what those people must have gone through to fracture their selves into so many places. Um, and I want to save the rest of the existential stuff about the self for next week because it's just so fascinating to me. And it we'll talk about gestalt therapy some more too, Gary. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, this would also be like Pavlov's dog and the conditioning and condition responses. And this is very much how many psychologists or psychiatrists still view their profession. It's like, we're dealing with condition responses. Um, we're not dealing with, we're not dealing with things like shame and guilt and all of that. We're dealing with physiological processes. And that's why you'll have many psychiatrists in particular, they won't even start talk therapy or, um, Ass assessment. What was the name again, James, for the therapy style they were using at the ranch? Oh, motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing. Like a lot of psychologists don't even want to do that until they believe they have the people's brain chemistry in a place that can receive the talking and counseling. And I'm not, I don't know enough about it to speak authoritatively, but I do know working in that group home, some of those kids were so sedated. Yeah, it was a lot easier to manage behavior around the home because they were sedated out of their minds, basically. And I don't know how well you can help someone change their mental states if you have them completely numbed and subdued. And I told the therapist that I would rather deal with the acting out physical behavior without loot them having their mind basically with like a blanket over it and but that's me and and they did a lot more schooling than me and i was a young man but i can see the need for both possibly and that was kind of the conclusion i'll give a little mid talk summary that i came to as a young man if the brain is broken treat the brain if the mind is broken treat the mind like if there's actually brain damage or some chemical imbalance, then that might be an appropriate time for certain medications or change of diet or physical activity or things that's going to actually change your blood sugar and chemistry and serotonin and dopamine levels and all of that. Uh, but it, it's I don't think it's just about the chemicals. I think we also have this non-tangible mental place that you can't fix through medication or exercise or diet. It, it has to be done 
mentally or spiritually. All right. Identity theory. Um, I don't know much about identity theory, but it always does come up in philosophy of mind. And it seems to me like under behaviorism, you had all these different competing schools of thought going on. And that was the best I could make out of what identity theories were. And you can see, um, if you come down to the bottom sentence, or let's just read that bottom paragraph. Over the years, numerous objections have been levied against type identity, ranging from epistemological complaints. Um, uh, epistemology is the fancy word for theory of knowledge. In other words, you're violating some of the things we know about how we know things. Um, also, this idea that mental states are in fact capable of multiply realized. Defenders of type identity have come up with two basic strategies in response to Putman's claim. They restrict type identity claims to particular species or structures, or else they extend such claims to allow for the possibility of disjunctive physical kinds. To this day, the debate concerning the validity of these strategies and the truth of mind, brain, type identity rages in the philosophic literature. And I mostly just wanted you to be aware that there's a whole genre of debate and argument going on in philosophy of mind and psychology called identity theory. Um, but that's all I wanted to talk about that one. There's an obnoxious word, epiphenomenalism. <laughs> and I'm not going to read this. I'm just going to do my best to explain this. Um, they are a type of dualist, but not like Descartes' dualism. They're willing to acknowledge we have a brain and a mind. But this is where they differ. The epiphenologists say um, mind can affect mind, like Descartes, and physical can affect mind. But they would say physical can affect mental, but mental cannot affect physical. Kind of like they would see the mind like a shadow of the brain. And just like our body shadows, we have them because we have a brain. I mean, we have a body, but the shadow can't affect our body, right? Our shadow doesn't lead us, it follows us. And that's how I think they are seeing the mind and the brain. They're seeing the brain, the mind is like a shadow because we have a brain, but it doesn't have really any impact. So to me, they're just back to the behaviorist or the, the materialistic monist again. Even though they're giving lip service to the mind, it doesn't really do anything. They're just acknowledging it's a thing, but a thing like a shadow. Okay. Good. Well, that was easy for such a, a big word. Our, oops, consciousness. Um, the guy I'm living up with in Humboldt, he's a nurse, and um, he was a biology major in college. And in his chemistry classes, and this is up at Humboldt State in Northern California, and so most of his professors are naturalist, materialist um, scientists. They only believe in the physical material world. And he would ask them, what is the chemical equation of consciousness? And they didn't like that. And because consciousness isn't a physical material thing. So how do we study it? But that's something that we have as human beings and not just human beings. I believe animals are conscious. I would even go so far to say plants are conscious. And it, it has to do with this being a living being there is a type of conscious awareness. So explaining the nature of consciousness is one of the most important and perplexing areas of philosophy, but the concept is notoriously ambiguous. The abstract noun consciousness is not frequently used by itself in the contemporary literature, but originally derived from the Latin con with, 
and seer to know. Perhaps the most commonly used contemporary notion of a conscious mental state is captured by Thomas Nagel's famous, what is it like? And um, this has to do with the article he wrote, and I put the links for you, and I think it's in the next slide or two, about it's what is it like to be a bat, is this article he wrote. Because he said, we can study all, and why is this sick? He says, we can study all sorts of things external, externally and empirically, you know, through our microscopes and our telescopes and our CAT scans. But he says, how do you study consciousness? What's the tools for studying the psyche? You can't use a microscope or a telescope. You can't use a CAT scan to find someone's consciousness. So where is it and what is it? And I would relate it back to our discussion of what the mind is. It's part of that non-tangible part of being human. Any other thoughts on consciousness out there, what it is? Yes. Being a living being, you have consciousness. Relate that to the plants. So being conscious means you have an internal sense of awareness of being and how things are affecting you. So, and this is part of what Thomas Nagel's article, maybe I need to write an article of what is it like to be a tree? But he wrote, what is it like to be a bat? Because he said, bats are mammals like us. Um, they obviously have an internal world going on, but there's different from us in other ways. For example, instead of using their eyes, their primarily sense of information gathering is through their ears. And they have sonar and they chirp their way through the world to collect the sound waves bouncing, bouncing back and they can navigate in flight, they can catch food, they can find a mate all through, the, through their ears, through this sonar that somehow I'm assuming their brain is making images in their head coming through sound waves where ours is coming through light waves through our eyes is how I'm making images in my head. But remember, the stuff I'm seeing isn't, I'm not seeing it out there. I'm seeing everything in here. And that is freaky <laughs> to think about. So what Thank Thomas you. Nagel's ans asking is, what is it like to be a bat? And I kind of want to save that for next week, where for those of you that are interested, I put two links up. One is the full article, but it's like 15 pages long. And the other is someone did a blog that summarized it, but he did an excellent job in one page summarizing the 15. So whatever you have time for, or maybe you'll like the one page one and say, I want to read the whole article. But after about page three, uh, here's a little spoiler. Um, Thomas Nagel realizes I don't think we can know what it's like to be a bat because in order to know what it's like to be a bat, you would have to be a bat. That's not something a human studying bats externally can tell. Now we can measure how much they weigh. Um, we can look at their genetics, their DNA, anything physical we can measure and hypothesize or theorize about. But what about the internal conscious state of a bat's awareness. How in the world do we begin to even think about that? But I think that's super pertinent when we bring it back into psychology um, because that's in a sense what you all are trying to do in a sense with your clients. And you are trying to get them to share with you their internal um, subjective condition. And, but I think you would probably agree, and I want to get into this a lot more next week when we talk about existential philosophy is even if someone tells us everything, if they're completely transparent and everything else, because we're not them, we're going to miss stuff. Because even what they're sharing is going to have unique specific meaning to them than it's going to have to you because you were not, you're not them, basically.
when I am in a conscious mental state, there is something it is like for me to be in that state from the subject subjective or first person point of view. But how are we to understand this? For instance, how is the conscious mental state related to the body? Can consciousness be explained in terms of brain activity? What makes a mental state be a conscious mental state? The problem of consciousness is arguably the most central issue in current philosophy of mind and is also importantly related to major traditional topics in metaphysics, such as the possibility of immortality and the belief in free will. This article focuses on Western theories and conceptions of consciousness, especially as found in contemporary and analytic philosophy of mind. We already discussed this. So the two leading theories having to do with philosophy of mind are dualism. That's the belief in both a physical material and a, a mental or non-material state. And then the materialist um, physicalism, they only believe in the physical material worldview. And so I'm sure you have come across a lot of that in your literature. And I think it's good to know their theories and their practices. But if you do believe there is a soul or a spirit, um, materialism is probably not the right theory for you, as you can well imagine. Professor, yeah. let me, let me um, get your feedback on this. This but, is Just nice real quick, James. I, if while well, we're talking, if you guys want to, I was hoping you could click on those links, but I don't think I hyperlinked them into my PowerPoint. But you could, can you copy them? No, nope. but you can at least write them down yes. and look those up if you want. Okay, James, you have my yeah, attention. I, well, here's an experience, and I want you to give me your thoughts about it. I was uh, called to do an intervention. So I prepared got myself ready to do the intervention which was going to happen that week. Well, two days out, I visioned the intervention step by step. I saw the intervention take place before it took place. So when I get to the home of the family that I'm going to do the intervention, everything was set up exactly what I saw. Everything happened exactly what I saw. So I just walked out what I saw. What was that? What would you, how would you classify that? That uh, sounds very spiritual to me. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. But come from a materialistic or uh, from a phil philosophical perspective, uh, what happened consciously, subconsciously, spiritually oh like how would a materialist explain that yes okay they would simply say what it probably did this happen while you were sleeping james uh, your mic's back off yeah yeah that one happened but i have several of them one that happened when i was wide awake and i saw the whole thing happen in front of my eyes and well, this would work for both cases, the explanation. Okay, okay. So, and this is how, um, I'm going to close this down so I can see you guys. I'll put it back up if anyone needs to see it again. Um, I think it relates kind of like intuitive knowledge. Like you didn't get there because you researched or did other things. It just kind of like came to you, whether sleeping or awake. And I think what the behavior, the materialist would say is that, well, it's not like an angel whispered that in your ear or the heavens open and God gave you revelation, but subconsciously you had probably picked up all these cues about the family and their dynamic and what would be the best way because of your schooling and classes and previous life experience all of that in your subconscious kind of congealed like this vision of what needed to happen. And that's how I think they would explain it. Okay. It, it yeah. was all in you. You just hadn't been able to piece it together. Yeah. But I never saw these people until I saw them. 
Oh, then. And, and yet I, I saw them. I in don't the vision. know them. <laughs> right. And yet I saw them in the vision and they were exactly who I saw. I don't think there would be an explanation <laughs> for that. And so I've, I've experienced that multiple times. Well, keep that in your toolbox. They can't teach that in school. <laughs> All right. Was everyone able to copy down those um, two websites? One's the short version and the other's the full article. Could you put them back up, please? Yes. I'm sorry I don't have them hyperlinked. I'll pay more attention next week. Um, so the first one it is the full article, and I think it's between 15 and 17 pages. And um, the second one is just the one page blog blog. And it, like I said, it really does capture the essence of what I want to talk about. But some of you might be fascinated by this, so I gave you the both. But the the bottom one is enough for what I want to do in class. And it will tie into when we get into more existential themes and gestalt therapy next week and begin to look at, because they are not necessarily materialist. Um, many of them, oh, some of them are, but it's a spectrum. And many of them believe there is a non-material part of ourselves. And so I would like to talk about some of the history of philosophy, especially um, with Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, David Brower, who was a physician, medical physician in Vienna, but he's the one that started that talk therapy, which I believe Freud adopted and became like his um, psychoanalytic approach. But it had to do with having conversations with his clients or patients. All right. And one last slide for you tonight. This is another book. I This is by the same author that wrote, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And Holy cow, this book changed my life. <laughs> the View from Nowhere by Thomas Nagel. And I just put a little uh, note up there. Basically, this book is explaining why humans cannot be objective. And in one sentence, it's because we're subjects. And subjects have subjective points of view. The only being in the cosmos that could have an objective point of view. And that, once again, it depends how you divide, define objectivity. But normally when we talk about being objective, we're talking about being um, outside of, right? We're, we're without bias. We're without personal perspective or point of view or bigotry. And so to be objective is to kind of have like this bird or God's eye view of things where the subjective is like the individual looking up. And basically Thomas Nagel is saying, um, because we are these individual subjects, we cannot have this perspective. Because even if someone told us this perspective, it would have to pass through our little perspective. And we're gonna change it to what we can handle, what we can understand, what we can relate. And that's what I want to talk about next week. Um, what it's like to be a bat. Is objectivity possible for humans? Or are we all limited to our own personal subjective truths? And then I want to talk about some of the development of philosophy in the West. I mean, not philosophy, psychology in the West. And get into some gestalt and existential type therapy. And when I listened um, to Hayden talk last week, I was really struck by how much of what I would consider existential type techniques he was using in his um, counseling approach. But I thought they were wonderful because they were personable. They treated each person as an individual, um, not trying to conform them into something else, but trying to enter into their world and help them become healthy. And I really love that. And I think there, it's very compatible with uh, a lot of biblical teaching as well. 
Okay, that's all I want to lecture tonight, but I will linger as long as you guys want to engage me, or Tracy tells me she needs to wrap it up. Fred, could you put up the identity theory? Um, yes. Once. Yeah, there were a lot of names in there that I did not know. Okay. I was hoping it would ring a bell Thank with you. some of you all in your readings, but um, I think it is like sub-schools of behaviorism, and maybe as that's going out of vogue, so too are these authors and their schools of thought. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, there... I have a question. Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, I, I have a question. Because one of the things I was been curious about with just the climate that our world is in right now, and you mentioned something in regards to like, are we just limited as individuals to our own subjectivity? And yes. I know you're going to talk about that next week, but um, like curious mind wants to know, like, uh, is that is there truth in that? Well, in my... That we're just limited to our own subjectivity? Are you asking me my opinion? Yes. I would say it's incredibly true. And I would okay. say there is perhaps one exception. And that would be direct revelation from the Holy Spirit that transcends our, our personal subjective state. But if you're talking to someone that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit or a spirit period, you can imagine that would have very little weight with them. Okay. Well, I'm definitely what tuning in. What is your name? Week. iPhone number two. It's, sorry. It's <laughs> Lucinda Miller. Hi, Lucinda. Thank you. Yeah. My apologies. Um, well, and I'm it is really quite, ups it's really upsetting to a lot of um, Christians and evangelicals um, it reminds me a lot of kind of like the debate that was happening with the Protestant Reformation, right? And mm -hmm. both groups are claiming the Bible is authoritative. But if you're familiar mm -hmm. with medieval Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church claimed to have the, they were the ones who had the authority to correctly interpret scripture. And so mm -hmm. if you're just some rogue Joe theologian or luther theologian and the church says it means one thing and you're saying no i think it means something else well you were expected to conform to their interpretation and yeah we just my apologies go ahead part of the fear of the catholic church of the protestant reformation was instead of having one interpretation if it opened up, you would have thousands or everyone would begin to interpret the Bible under their own light or their own reason or their own spirituality. And mm -hmm. in some ways, I think it's the same fear with this idea of because this bothers a lot of scientists as well as religious people, because scientists want there to be objective truth, too. Right. They want there to be laws yeah. of nature. They want there to be physical material laws that we can make predictions on. And if everything becomes subjective and a matter of personal opinion or insight, it, it makes the world anarchy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone... yeah. Yeah. And that is well, the... what I'm thinking end of existentialism yeah. it leads to anarchy because of this hyper individual relativistic subjective truth i guess what i'm trying what i'm i'm looking for hope in the sense that uh there can be like one unifier which is faith our you know our belief in god and jesus um because there was an image of like the three blind man and the elephant and each one who just touched a different side had a different perspective, what it was, because they're not able to see the whole picture. So I just am hopeful that with faith, it can like bring us out of that individualistic subjectivity and just be able to just 
see things in a broader sense where it's not just limited to our activity in order to just have better relationships and be able to help people when we're not just on our own individual way of uh, perspective per se or sub, you know subjectivity yeah that would be nice lucinda <laughs> it's just <laughs> The thing is, even the conversation we're having right now and the words you're sharing with me, they're probably meaning something different to me than what you're meaning, than what you're trying to relate to me. That is how difficult this is, because we do live in our own individual worlds. And that's what that view from nowhere is all about in that R.D. Lang book I posted up. And I don't not expect you to read that whole book by next week. I just thought if you're interested in the discussion we have, and I'll draw it out for you next week, what he, I mean, I'll do it now if you want to be thinking about it over the week. I can do a short version and we'll redo it next week. We have enough um, time. Okay. okay. So I wish I had a whiteboard here, but I'll just have to use my hands to draw. So normally if we're talking about being objective, <clears throat> will look at me as the viewer, and you all have the same screen as I do, so I'll use this. And so I'm looking at each of these little Hollywood squares, right? And But in doing that, I'm kind of objectifying all of you. Like, there's the box that is the object of Linda, of James, of Walter, of Arlene, of Heidi. And I am a subject looking at all these objective boxes with sub subjects in those boxes. But in the sense, I'm kind of objectifying you all right now because I'm looking at you as things to make this illustration. But what R.D. Lang is saying is, if you really want to be objective, I need to step back from myself observing you all, and I need to observe myself observing you. Because I have to think, am I hyper and excited because I get to teach and I'm like a kid in a candy store and do I have low blood sugar am I fatigued um, did someone just break up with me did I lose a family member um, am I sleep deprived I need to observe my own mental state because that is going to affect the Fred that is observing you all but if I really really want to be objective I have to step back from myself, observing myself, and observe myself, observing myself, observing you. And this is why the book is called A View from Nowhere, because there is no place we can get to, no epistemological vantage point where we can see objectively, because no matter how high or big our view is, it's still coming from us. And that's why it's called A View from Nowhere. And when I read that, I just thought, my God. Now, I wouldn't go so far to say there is no objective truth. But after reading that book, I sure would go so far to say, I sure don't know what it is. Does that help? Or does that make it worse? I actually found it quite freeing. And I thought intellectually quite humbling. And like the story you were talking about, like the five, three, five, six mm -hmm. blind men and the mm -hmm. elephant, how many ever you want, it's the same point. I think we need to have intellectual, academic, professional, psychological humility when we're helping a client to realize that we have a limited subjective perspective and we may be missing something. And we don't have the big objective picture of their whole life and all their needs and all their relationships. Now, it doesn't mean we can't seek a um, unity between the subjective client and the subjective counselor, but to realize neither of us has God's own view. We are both coming from limited, broken human perspectives, and I think that's healthy. I think that can help us from becoming proud or arrogant or other sorts of things if we think we know it all or we got every angle covered or all of that. Comments, questions? Did that um, book cause you to question your faith 
by chance or like no not at all i just was so excited that um this is how i would define objective or absolute truth because i see objective truth as absolute truth it's a really high bar and i'm a human for heaven's sakes i see things as a human sees things do you guys that were with me last year i did a talk called um philosophy of the self it was the same it was a four-part series and i talked about immanuel kant who is the father of modern philosophy and he made a distinction between phenomena and noumena and he said noumena is as things actually are phenomena is how we perceive things and he said we can only experience the phenomenal world and we experience it as humans. That's why I find that what is it like to be a bat article so fascinating because I can't do it. I don't know what the world is for a bat or a tree or a muskrat or a woman or a black person. I don't because I'm none of those things. And it's acknowledging that subjective difference that we have. Um, but the more I began to think about it, and this is not in R.D. Lang's book, and I will share this, even though I'm going to share it again next week. God, like us, can see the world as subjects like there's trees, there's people, uh, there's a cat, there's a dog, and he has this heavenly view. But unlike us, God not only sees them externally, but God knows what it's like to be me internally. God knows what it's like to be the tree growing in the forest. God knows what it's like to be a salmon in the sea. This is the panentheism I'm talking about. I'm not saying God is me or the tree or the fish, but God knows what it's like from an internal state. Like when I am walking through the forest, God is getting to enjoy my enjoyment subjectively traveling through the woods. Even though he made it and he is in all places, he is also in me walking through his own creation. And so that's how I would define objective or absolute truth, having all perspective all the time. And God has that. I have one perspective. Now, I can switch different perspectives, almost like putting on goggles and look at things in different ways or get different vantage points or meet different people. But I still only have one perspective at a time, where God has totality of all perspective all the time. So it actually made God bigger for me, not smaller. <laughs> I was excited. And it made me more humble. And I really started to realize, Fred, why are you arguing with people? You're arguing with the whole internal world that I don't understand. So get them to share it with you. And that's what I like about where we're going to go with the existentialist therapy next week is they realize that these people that are broken or mentally ill or whatever label we don't want to put on it is they're not able to come out and interact with others. So the counselor or therapist job is to enter into their world as much as we're able. It's kind of like if you have children. Um, children do not have the mental or life experience to engage us in an adult way. But we do have the capacity as adult to enter the world of a child to a degree. And it's just magical, right? And to actually enter into a child's world, drink, have a tea, imaginary tea from a, a toy setting, right? We get to enter into that world of play and fantasy and, and all of that. And then eventually, hopefully, as we raise them and they grow, They'll be able to enter other adult worlds, but as children, they simply aren't able to do that. And I would say the same with people that are struggling with different types of mental issues or behavioral issues. They may not be in a place yet to come out and interact or play nice with others. And it's, can we go in and meet them where they are? And I really appreciate that about the existential thought. All right. Any more comments, questions? This is Dr. Ray. Oh, man, that was amazing. I can't help but chime in, though, with the rhombus, you know, rhombus model, which is the diamond shape. So that's what a rhombus is. And just how that dovetailed with 
just being a professional and trying to look at things from multiple angles um, as a professional, you know, you want to look at all the different avenues, but I think you said it best when it's like, you're doing it in humility, you know, because we don't have all the perspectives, but you're giving it your best try. Yes. I don't know if you have a comment about that. Just you're giving it your, your <laughs> best prayerfully and humbly and fearfully. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And like, these are people's lives we're talking about, right? We're not talking about bacon cookies or other things where we're following a recipe. And if we mix it just right and we bake it in the oven for amount of time, it's going to come out. And that's not how therapy works or human beings work. And we need to meet them where they are. And that's what I so appreciated, Ray, about listening to your talk last week um, and how you engage the clients. And it was on such a personal, subjective level. It wasn't just like, here's the program. And it's not that you can't have rules and guidelines, right? That sometimes that's very necessary for health and safety and other things to occur. But the therapy itself, it's not about a formula. It's not about a system. It's not like checking off boxes. You're trying to get into this core being that has somehow been hurt or traumatized or broken and give them a hand. That was like one of the best um, memes I ever saw the difference explaining between sympathy and empathy was the sympathy, you had a guy, someone was down in a pit in despair, and the sympathetic person was sitting on the top of the hole feeling bad for them, where the empathetic person crawled down into the hole with them and sat with them in the hole. And I just thought, yeah, that's a whole other degree of caring, right? Where we're not just feeling bad for someone, but we're willing to suffer with them. That's actually what the word care, the Anglo-Saxon root comes from, kara which means to suffer with. And so when we tell someone we don't care, it's like literally telling them, I'm not willing to suffer with you. When I tell someone I care, that means I'm willing to go through hell and high water with them. I'm there for you. Even if it hurts me too, we're gonna do it together. Well, you know, one of the things I just wanted to make a comment on, um, I'm new with starting down this avenue of, of the schooling, um, but I definitely can see how what you're saying is just so helpful because what I have noticed in my experience of working with uh, like teenagers and kids, um, the majority of it comes down to a power struggle, like they're struggling for power in their life or or some control over their life because of whatever trauma or life experience that they have that, that they've been robbed of that. So that's the number one thing they're fighting for. So I feel like with this method, you meeting them where they are gives them an opportunity to be empowered yes. instead of saying, hey, you have to follow this rule this exact same way. Let me meet you where you are to help give you that empowerment that you desperately are seeking for. Then we have somewhere to start with. Yes, it's very so much a walk. That alongside approach instead of leading or pushing them from behind you are walking with them and it's beautiful you so know. this is linda i have a question for ray how would i access his rombush university talk from last week uh dr mccready can get it for you okay yeah, thank we you. can send that to you if you'd like to um I can get your email. That okay. Was, yeah, if you can send Thank that you. to me in the you chat. You could type the email in the chat box, Mom. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, well, we'll definitely, um, next week, I'll dedicate. I find that so interesting, Cindy, what you said about power struggle, because that was Nietzsche's whole problem and why it was so why he pro never went to therapy. There's actually a movie, a book, and they made a movie out of it. It called um, When Nietzsche Wept. And even though it's a historical fiction, like I don't think he ever did therapy with uh, David Brower, who is that physician from Vienna 
but they did live in the same city at the same time, along with Sigmund, a young Sigmund Freud. And so in this book, it's like a historical novel, like what if Nietzsche would have met this one of the first talk therapists? And it's fascinating because Nietzsche's trip was will to power. And if you went to someone for help because you were having depression or mental anxiety or fear, it showed you were weak. So he would never let anyone help him or put himself under another's care because now he did have horrible physical ailments. And I think he did meet Brower to help with his stomach and indigestion because he took a lot of opiates to try to sedate his mind just to shut it off. But then that caused him physical issues as well as his mental struggles. But because of this will to power, he believed all human life comes down to everyone is out for themselves mm. and they're going to try to get what they can and use you. And so you have to protect yourself. And here's a nice little contrast. As Jesus, Jesus sent his disciples out as sheep among wolves, Nietzsche sent his disciples out as wolves among sheep. He's like, don't be a sheep be a wolf. And so you could imagine how difficult that would be to help someone like that, who even sees seeking help as weakness. Well, that's a really interesting point. I just want to say this one last thing, because I was just working with some um, medical students, and we were talking about self-care and talking about uh, anxiety and, and burnout. And one of the problems that medical students have is that medical doctors don't supposed to have any kind of mental illness. So this stops them from going to get help. And it just reminds me exactly what you just talked about, because right. that's one of the stigmas that stops them from being able to reach out to get, because they have an enormous amount of resources available to them for anxiety, depression, but they don't seek it because of that reason, kind of following up Denisha's example. Yes. And even though I think it's got much better, um, there still is a stigma attached if you seek counseling or therapy, and depending on what kind, especially. And that's something I think the psychology um, world has done better at. They've made it more normal, like, hey, just like you need a physical checkup, it's not a bad idea to get a mental checkup every now and again. And, and I think that's helpful to make it, because in the past it was more specialized and you'd hear the dramatic extreme cases and you don't hear about just the day in day out of how many people get help just navigating their lives or it, it might just be for a season and for others if they find it helpful to always have someone they could talk to on that level the other thing too is um i think this is only the case in in more extreme um, Christian communities, but um, Christian psychology or counseling is relatively novel as well, because it was almost seen like, oh, that's the devil's field. And um, we shouldn't be into that. We should pray for people or we should give them, read them psalms and hymns and things like that, but not deal with psychology. and. I think that has changed a lot, but there still is that kind of fear that um, we should just be seeking God's wisdom, not worldly wisdom. And all I would say is, absolutely, we should seek godly wisdom. But even Nietzsche, with all his problems, was such a keen observer of the human psyche. I think we can learn so much from him. I think his observations were correct. It was his solutions that I found disturbing. And unhelpful. He was identifying the problem, like the kind of world we're living in, but the way he wanted to solve it was to become like this Oberman, this one who rises above the herd that isn't influenced by the common masses and rabble. But see, Jesus was the same sort of character, but not because of his ego or will to power. It was he laid down his power to show something even more powerful. And um, it it's amazing. They both observe similar things about the human condition, but one became a suffering servant 
the other wanted us to rage against the machine or the man or the power or those that tried to conform us. Well, I'll tell you, it's um, really phenomenal. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. No, you started. I was just saying it, it was just really phenomenal because just a little bit that I learned on like the gray matter on the brain when you see it with people, kids that have had trauma and you recognize that because of that effect, it causes like delayed reaction. And so just working with kids alone make me just in this short amount of time, a greater understanding of be more patient with them. Literally, it's just taking a longer time to process. And it's just yeah. definitely those two can be married. Thank you. And Sandy, I just want to tap on that before we go to the next person. Um, that's my problem with the uh, epiphenomenalist is absolutely our mental states can affect our physiology. And I'm sure you guys have studied this already, like synapses that wire together, fire together. When we learn new activities, we're actually changing, physically changing the brain. And so how can you tell me thoughts do not affect the physical? And I'm not saying I can just look at the blemishes on my hand and thank them away or things like that, but there's definitely effect on our mental states. And my friend who's a nurse has also brought this up. Um, even though he doesn't believe in God, he says people that pray and have faith and hope, he says he actually sees a difference in them in their recovery as opposed to people that don't have that in their life and, and i know that's anecdotal but there's a lot of that anecdotal sort of evidence even among behavior or materialists and whether it's a placebo or just feeling good or hopeful but it is somehow actually affecting our body chemistry well and think about how stress and anger or bitterness or wrath or malice affects your gut, right? And all different parts of your body. It's it's not just our heads. It it affects us. Is it Gosla? Gozia? I can't my yes, core that, eyes. That's that's okay. Yeah, Gosha. So um uh, I, I have a lot Is of Is that how you of... pronounce it? Gosha. 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 Nice to meet you, Gosha. I have a lot of, you know, trains going on in my head right now, but um, the objectivism, that's that's fascinating. Do, do you think that Jesus was the most objective of, of, of living uh, uh, of living beings uh, or, or, or not? No, he seemed to really embrace being clothed in humanity. But he's also is the best example, I would say, of the one exception I have because of his relationship with the father and how he always yielded his subjective personal will to the will of the father. I think that allowed him access because he knew things that he should not have been able to know as a human, like seeing Philip under the fig tree or whatever, stuff like that, or um, things where he did seem to have a supernatural awareness, but for the most part, he seemed to live as a man within human confines of physicality and mentality, but he constantly had that daily relationship with the Father seeking his will. And all the scriptures say he always um, subsumed his will to the Father's will, even to the point of death. He didn't want to die, at least according to the event in Gethsemane, but he was willing to even die if it was the will of the Father. Uh, I found that profound. And then also the um, uh, in in the Bible it says that if if your faith is you know as strong or as big as the size of a of a mustard seed, you can you can move mountains. And you know, of course, that's that's literally not able to to move your mug, right? Um, uh, how how do you would you comment on that? How, are we not capable of that as human beings, being subjective and all, or is, is does it take a particular state to be in? Or um, what's your thought on that? I'm sorry, I I can't well, specify the question. This more. is not original with me, but I always thought it was a an amount as well. 
But if you look at the verse, it's, it doesn't say the size of a mustard seed. It says if you have the faith of a mustard seed. And so then I began to think, well, what kind of faith does a mustard seed have? That it can grow, that it can thrive, that it can bear fruit? I don't know. And I think that's just, and the other thing is I want to point out about faith is that kind of faith is given by measure from God. It's not self-generated. It's not wishful thinking. And I think there's a qualitative difference between saving faith, which is a gift from God. It's a full knowledge that God gives us and assurance. And it didn't come through reason or emotion or life experience. It's the gift of God. And then those sorts of things we also call faith, like that our sports team's going to win or that our, our daughter will win the spelling bee or whatever. But that's not faith. That's not God-given faith. Those are wishful thinking. And I think it's important to distinguish the two. And in a lot of times, I simply tell God, I don't have enough faith. And if he wants me to believe, he has to give me more. Because I don't want it to come from me wishful thinking. If it's something God really wants me to know and believe, he has to give it to me. But now we're in full spiritual mode. We have left the materialist and dualist behind because we're talking about a different type of knowledge now, one that I believe comes from God. And this, if, if I was a therapist, this is where, and I'd like to hear next week, maybe you could tell me like, um, do you only take Christian patients? Are you willing to counsel people that aren't believers? Um, how do you counsel someone that you can't appeal to scripture or the Holy Spirit with? And I mean, I'm hoping you're counseling believers and non-believers alike, because they certainly both need it. But I imagine for some people, they would say, no, I can only deal with these people because the truth I want to share with them, these people can't receive, at least not at this time. And do any of you have any delineations like that in your counseling or are planning on it? Or would you counsel someone different that was in Christ from someone who was not? I sure would. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, sorry, I am not able to turn on my camera, and I want to say you. thank you. Hi, uh, it was really amazing, and I really, really enjoy the philosophy, because philosophy is sort of like my weakness point in a study, and that was really amazing. You explained everything very uh, simple and understandable. I wanted to say thank you about oh, that. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then second, uh, yes, uh, I think if we actually be a true believer and believe in what God said to us as he loves everybody, because everyone is his creature. Yes, and made in his as, image. Uh, exactly, and uh, as a person who just like came from Islamic things, I think no matter what people believe, we just need to focus on helping individual as you know the image of god and yeah. i think when we have our biases of specifically being muslim or being christian or jewish sorry or jewish or whatever mm -hmm. we are not able to give actually uh, our gift that is love to others therefore i think it's better so we be with the community, they are the same, to, uh, have the same thought as us. But if someone asks for help, I think we shouldn't deny that, you know, important part of humanity as, you know, the, the gift that God gives us to give to others. Yes. Thank you, Heikia. And, and that's something I think, once again, back to that individual piece, we can explain to the person who's asking us our help. It's like, I'm a believer. I, I walk with Jesus. That's how I make it through the day. Um, I know you don't know Jesus, but 
I would be happy to help you in ways that I can. And we could still help people maybe through addictions or other issues. But in the end, of course, I want people to know Jesus. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to base my willingness to help someone on whether or not they believe in Jesus. Because once again, I don't, I think that's a gift from God. I don't think it's through me being clever or being a good evangelist or making um, intellectual arguments, but it's actually showing the love of Jesus to them because I have Jesus in me. It's not even my love I'm giving them. They're actually getting the love of Jesus, and that's powerful. And can I add well, something? Yes. Uh, it's, it's short. I think when you put your heart truly to what you believe and uh, uh, give it uh, to someone else's without expectation. I think it, there is always something that that person even change, changes his or her belief to what was before. You know, I think so, sort of some biases come from confer, uh, confronting each other and we wanted to show that we are right. And that one causes that conflict and, you know, every different thing. But I think when you just show them how, you know, the light of God uh, showed you the way, the path, people also, I think, come to you to be one of, you know, those people too. Yes. I, I have a lot of intellectual arguments against just about everything, but I have no apologetic or argument against love. And when someone's loving on you, what are you going to say? <laughs> and it's powerful. Love is powerful. Let me, in, in my part of tonight with this, this is a quote I heard this week, and it's just kind of become my, my mantra for right now. And we were talking, one of my former students came up and visited me and he said, um, Fred, how would you define a good day? And because I'm such a obsessive compulsive perfectionist, <laughs> in my natural mind, a good day for me is one where I haven't made any mistakes or done anything wrong. So you can imagine how many good days I have. <laughs> <laughs> but he said oh he said well i just heard someone say for them a good day is loving god and i thought oh my god that is so much better than my idea of a good day because i can love god even when i'm not doing well i still love god and then i would just add to that and others right love god love others and you've had a good day easy peasy <laughs> although some people are harder to love than others even ourselves sometimes. Thank you for having me, and I'm so excited for next week. I'm going to start prepping tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very awesome. Thanks, Thanks for coming, Thank you all. Thank you so much. I We're think excited Dr. to have you next week. Tracy, has, you have some um, rhombus business you do each week. Um, actually, it, it really depends on how long you want to go. At 8 o'clock, we do have groups, uh, mentorship groups for those um, individuals. And they know okay, they so some people stay till 8. And then, well, this will give them a chance to use the bathroom and, there you and go. all that. So Absolutely. thank you for thank having you. me. And I don't know who of my guests showed up because I can only see five screens. But um, thanks for joining me. And it was a pleasure. Good night. Okay. Thank you. We'll Thank see you. you next week. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thanks. Good night. Okay. Um, for those of you who are here for the mentorships groups of either Dr. Roslyn or myself, Dr. Tracy, um, please stay. If you're not and you're with somebody else as far as your mentor, we'll see you all next week. Okay. So you take care and. Um, for those who are here, please uh, just give us a couple minutes and we'll split up into the breakout rooms, okay? Bye bye. Have a good one, Dr. Tracy. Yeah. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>
Okay, let's see who we have here. Okay. So for Jose and Juan, I wish you well, and we're going to split up now into the groups with Dr. Roz and Dr. Tracy. And there you go, everyone. Hi, Tuan, Tracy, Dr. Tracy here. Um, and I don't know if you're still with us. Um, indeed, though, we're going to split up um, my group as well as Dr. Raza's. So I wish you well and I hope you have a good night.